Uh, we're interested in the philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system. Uh, Aristotle asserts in politics that it is not the form of government ruled by the one, the few, or the many that matters most, but rather the ends of government that are most important. Where in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution did the framers set forth the ends of government? How did the framers differ, if at all, about the ends of government should be, about how the ends of government should be prioritized? Which of the ends of government set forth in the Declaration and Constitution appear to have the highest priorities today? Please begin. And surely from a practical point of view, it much concerns us to know this end. For then, like archers shooting at a definite mark, we shall be more likely to attain what we want. In Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle emphasizes the importance of knowing the ends of one's government, because we cannot achieve these ends without first defining them. The framers set forth the ends of government within the preambles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Coming out of the ideological fervor of the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence explains that the government is created to secure the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and that when government fails to do so, the people have a right to alter or abolish it. The government must protect these natural rights, otherwise it will be overthrown, an ideal that was central to the American Revolution. The Declaration as a whole gives us a very clear idea of the ends of government, but never describes how to achieve those ends. The Constitution also lays out the ends of government in its preamble, describing them as promoting justice, tranquility, the common defense, general welfare, and liberty. These ends, however, were added in a single sentence near the end of the Constitutional Convention by Governor Morris and the Committee of Style, passing with no opposition. This was because the purpose of the Constitutional Convention was not to debate the purpose of government, but instead to argue about the best form that would fulfill this purpose. The resulting document, our Constitution, focuses much more on the means of achieving those ends rather than the ends themselves. The framers did not differ about how the ends of government should be prioritized because they were primarily focused on creating a new stable government. However, they did differ on how best to achieve that end. The emphasis on stability at the convention came as a result of living through the anarchy under the Articles of Confederation. They realized that the purpose of their gathering was to create a government that would last. In fact, on June 26th of the Constitutional Convention, Elbridge Gerry stated that all of the proposed ideas aimed at the same end but there are great differences as to the means. This end that they all aimed towards, a stable, lasting government, was agreed upon. They instead differed on how best to achieve that end. The government they designed hit upon this end, using checks and balances to mediate opposing interests, ensuring that only bills agreed upon by all interests became law. As circumstances have changed over time, our prioritization of ends beyond the original goal of stability has changed to meet it. In the last 20 years, for example, President George Bush's first State of the Union focused primarily on terrorism and the Afghanistan war in response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, as he implicitly espoused the common defense above all else. Later, President Barack Obama used his first State of the Union to highlight his plans for job creation in response to the ongoing Great Recession, making the general welfare of those hurt by the failing economy the priority. Today, our prioritization of ends still differs based on the circumstances. As COVID-19 began to threaten the American way of one mid-March, different states took different approaches to containing it. In California, for example, Governor Gavin Newsom ordered a shelter in place for all residents on March 19th, prioritizing the physical health of his state or the general welfare. However, in Florida, Governor Rob DeSantis waited until April 1st to order a lockdown because he was fearful of the economic damage as he prioritized individual and economic liberty. These two approaches show that America is still fundamentally conflicted over which ends take priority. The framers focused primarily on stability in their creation of the Constitution, as without that end, they knew that none of the others they laid out would matter. Because that is not an issue today, we are able to focus on the ends laid out in the Declaration and Constitution and adapt them to the times. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. Uh, well, let's uh, look a bit farther into, further into the uh, ideas you've uh, presented to us so effectively. Um, it, I'm sure you know uh, that the Constitution does not mention the idea of democracy, uh, and uh, Aristotle uh, was not entirely enthusiastic about it. 
uh, where then do we get this insistence that these ends of government, that where we conflate the ends of government uh, with the ideals of democracy? But we seem to do that. Uh, how does that happen? Well, I think that the ends of government are achieved through the ideals of democracy. Um, it is only through this representation of all these different voices and ideas that we can really reach the end of government that is best for all people. Um, in his discourses on Livy, Machiavelli actually talks about this balance of interests. Um, in this case, in the context of ancient Italy, it was between the rich and the poor. And he stated that only through an expression of all opinions would they be able to um, find this, this, or sorry, create laws that would best benefit the, uh, the group as a whole. And so I think that democracy is a key instrument in ensuring that we achieve these ends in the most effective way possible. And so I agree too that we like to emphasize the ideals of democracy because they allow all voices to be heard. Although direct democracy can become corrupt, um, the idea behind listening to all voices generally tends to lead to the best outcome. Um, in Federalist 10, Publius kind of lays out the same idea that we should have as many factions as possible in debate and argue about them um, so that we can choose the best one out of all of these opinions. And we can see this reflected in our structure of government. While it's not fully a democracy as uh, Aristotle saw it, it incorporates aspects of these democratic ideals. We vote for senators and representatives uh, to represent us. And then within the House and the Senate, they're forced to debate and discuss bills. They must pass through both chambers of Congress. The framers intentionally put in large elements of democracy because they believe that this discussion would lead to the best outcome. Great, thank you so much. I've got a question for y'all. So for the founders, one of the ends of a federal republic was to avoid the most common sort of faction, that between the rich and the poor. How effective has the US Constitution been in this regard? So I believe that the US Constitution has actually somewhat failed to um, create an adequate balance between the rich and the poor. Uh, according to a government uh, watchdog agency, the, or government watchdog organization uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, roughly 50% of Congress members have a uh, average net worth over $1 million. Um, a lot of this comes from the fact that it takes so much money to run for Congress in the first place. Um, and I believe that this is a vast overrepresentation of wealth uh, within government, and the Constitution really doesn't do much to address that. So let's um, uh, let's take a California specific example. Um, coming out of the progressive era, uh, California um, adopted initiative. A referendum and recall, three progressive uh, vehicles. They're obviously empowering of direct democracy. And there are plenty of examples of um, things that have been passed by the public that maybe don't work so well. And I think this is the sort of thing uh, that Aristotle was warning about in direct democracy when he raises concerns about direct democracy. Was Aristotle right to be concerned about that? Um, and how does that framework of progressive reforms fit with um, Aristotle, or does it fit not at all? And um, was he right to be concerned about direct democracy? I think that oh, absolutely. Oh, go ahead. I think that Aristotle was definitely right to be concerned about direct democracy. Um, without effect, without effectively filtering the voice of the masses, we have this kind of concept of mob rule, in which, uh, or in which tyranny of the majority uh, infringes upon the rights of the minority. Um, I believe when you were talking about California, you can look to Proposition 8, which banned the marriage of same-sex couples. And effectively, um, the institution that was designed to help promote more of a, to help promote the voice of the people, ended up working against that and discriminating against certain groups. And so I would agree with Brian here. Uh, there was actually a proposition in San Francisco just last year um, that was trying to overturn the ban on e-cigarettes. 
Um, and so there was uh, Jewel, which is an e-cigarette company, spent over half a million dollars trying to back this proposition. So I think that uh, direct democracy also allows for corruption from um, like the sense of anyone who has money can uh, send out mailers, can spend money on these elections and try to change the opinions of the people. I actually disagree with my unit mates. Uh, I believe Jean-Jacques Rousseau got it right in book two, chapter one of the social contract, uh, where he outlines this idea of the general will uh, or the idea that the government should be based on what the people want, um, which is why he advocates for a direct democracy. Um, I think that the, the proposition system, while it has its flaws, allows states to be truly responsive. May I finish my thought? Oh, um, yeah. Allows states to be truly responsive to the needs of their people uh, and let them have their voices truly expressed. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a hard time seeing the, uh, the, the, the timekeeper to know when, when, when the time is yeah. up. Uh, excellent discussion. Uh, you raised, uh, collectively, you raised issues that I'm very glad to hear today. Uh, you didn't simply, I think everybody is mentioning COVID-19. Uh, you put it in a very concrete form. The California uh, governor um, issued a de declaration of emergency on a particular day, uh, governor in Florida on a later day, and that had consequences for public health and it reflects public policy and priorities in a really important way. I think that was a great way uh, to do that. Uh, always like hearing from Machiavelli, uh, especially in a, uh, when you talk about him positively, because uh, he is far more influential um, than, uh, than in popular culture he's, he's ever allowed to be. So I had a great time with this conversation. I really wish we were going to be able to uh, have another conversation tomorrow, but uh, alas, here we are. Uh, and, um, so, uh, and I uh, look forward to hearing from all of you again as you go out your careers in law and business and, uh, and making the world a better place in the years to come. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll provide a little feedback. You know, um, one of the, the best uh, indicators of you providing a thoughtful, meaningful um, both response to our questions and uh, presentation is that I'm still thinking about exactly what I want to say. Um, and so you did a really nice job. It, um, you had a very calm and ordered uh, initial presentation that was really well fit for this particular kind of format um, where we're spending more energy um, just to attend to one another. But I would say also that I, I'm still thinking about this distinction that you're drawing between the Declaration and the Constitution. One is setting the ends and the other is providing the means by which, um, particularly in light of your um, repeated examples of political theorists who focus on founding, right? The importance of founding. So not only the American founders, but Machiavelli, right? Aristotle, uh, Rousseau, all of them in the Republican tradition with this focus on the founding of regimes and the Im import of that moment. Um, so I think if we had more time to sit in conversation, that would be something I would want to talk with you about, how you think about that. Thank you. So, I, so yeah, I was very, um, I was very impressed. Uh, any, any speech, set of remarks, whatever, that includes discussion of Gouverneur Morris uh, is, is uh, well worth listening to. He is a very understudied and underappreciated uh, member of that constitutional convention in the founding era. Um, I really like the way you set up the Florida versus California example. And one of the things I really liked about it is, it, it, A, it illustrates the sort of federalism thing that there are different approaches going on, and B, you framed it in a very neutral way. You know, everybody's got a horse in this debate. I get that. Um, but the, the point of a federalism kind of system is, you may have to experiment with different approaches and then in an after action way, analyze uh, maybe what approaches worked and what approaches didn't. Uh, and um, it was very neutrally expressed and candidly, we're having some trouble with people who these days who seem to have difficulty doing that. And I thought that was really, really well done. On my question about the um, initiative referendum and recall, I think the dispute, I shouldn't say dispute, but the differences between members of the panel on that sort of illustrate what the issues are. I mean, those, those uh, progressive reforms occurred 
uh, because Lafayette and others were very concerned about what they perceived as too much power in the hands of business and assorted other problems. And yet, um, they also create uh, they also create issues where um, you know perhaps the rights of minorities aren't protected or there are other problems. And so, citing Rousseau, I thought was interesting. Um, uh, I'm I'm um, I'm not a fan of Rousseau, but I think in this context, it was exactly exactly correctly uh, the correct place to, to note uh, his uh, his involvement here so I thought it was a very strong presentation um, and I'm going to be pondering um, some of the things we talked about today um, I'll try not to ask the lawyers an oral argument next week about Rousseau and uh, initiative and referendum but um, that's the level of depth that I think we had today so very good thank you very much. Thank you.